Richard Niles, and I am so happy to be bringing you this interview with Rupert Holmes, composer for films and TV, singer-songwriter of many albums, including the hits Him and, of course, Escape, the Pina Colada song, producer and composer for Barbara Streisand, The Straubs, John Miles, award-winning author of books, plays, and musicals, this interview was done for a BBC Radio 2 series I did called Manhattan, the most musical island on earth. When Rupert's first album, Widescreen, came out in 1974, I was going to the Berklee College of Music, and I loved the album so much, I actually wrote him a fan letter saying I'd love to meet him. <laughs> well, he answered me in a very witty, typed and signed letter, which I still have and treasure. It said that I should go to a small cafe in Paris on the Rue Saint-Sulpice, where it is said that if you sit there long enough, everyone in the world will pass you by. And that when I see him, I should say hello. <laughs> so if you want to spend the next 45 minutes in the company of a very clever man and hear the story of his amazing career, well, let's hear him chat about Paul Simon, Barry Manilow, Melissa Manchester, all of his studio work, Barbara Streisand, Broadway, and a very big pina colada. Well, <laughs> keep listening. So why did so much great music come out of Manhattan? There are a lot of factors. I mean, some rather obvious ones. It's New York City's a, a rather big place. Um, it's, it's kind of extraordinary in its size. I grew up with New York City being my concept of what a city was. And I, I went away to college to like Syracuse, which is also called a city. Or you go to Seattle, which is called a city. And you say, this isn't a city. This is, this is New York is a city. It's huge. Uh, but beyond that, I don't know any city that's more ethnic than New York. And it's not just that you have neighborhoods that are dedicated to one country. You can go from an Italy-dedicated neighborhood, and by neighborhood, we don't mean just one block or one street. It's like blocks and blocks and blocks that are purely Italian, purely Hispanic, vast black population, grew up realizing that there are only two types of music, good and bad. That's Duke Ellington's theory. And so you have this incredibly eclectic uh, musical environment in which you uh, grow up, and, and, and the cross-pollination is amazing. A lot of drummers uh, in working in New York had to learn to play very strange tempos for Greek weddings, where they have the music changes its uh, time signature every bar. You go into bars of 718 and 3-5, and they had to learn that, and, and that helped a lot of them become jazz drummers playing in very strange idioms as well. When Brubeck started playing jazz, as in, in strange time signatures, um, a lot of it was derived from like Greek wedding music. Every coffee shop in New York is owned by a Greek family. Every coffee shop in New York City, I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit, sells moussaka. Why? It's because it's Greek ownership. So that kind of, when you have every possible ethnic community verging on another one and everyone traveling cross town and uptown and downtown and traveling through areas to get to other areas, you're going to get fusion whether you like it or not. Yeah. Well, so how did your musical training that you got here equip you for a musical career? Well, I was my background is classical. I went to Manhattan School of Music as originally a clarinet major and then decided that uh, I wanted to be a theory major and learn what makes music work. Why does it do the things to us that it does? Um, and the reason you go to a, a New York music school like uh, the Juilliard or Manhattan School of Music is because... Uh, there are lots of wonderful schools, but they're as good, that's as good as it gets. And one of the key reasons is because your teachers are the people playing for the New York Philharmonic. They're the people playing in the pit at the Metropolitan Opera. They're the people playing in the Broadway houses. Uh, when I first started recording, my teachers often were on my recording sessions because we wanted to get the best people we could, and, and they were. So, so that's the allure of, uh, of Manhattan uh, in terms of schools that you go to. You, you're... you're you're studying music at Lincoln Center, where the greatest musicians in the world are playing or singing, and your teachers are some of those people playing or some of the people directing that work. It, you just have a feeling that whatever, is, uh, whatever you're learning, you're getting from the source of the best there is. So how did you get your first gigs after you left college? 
I left Manhattan School of Music because my work was getting in the way of my education. Uh, I started hanging around Tin Pan Alley uh, from the first day that I went to Manhattan School of Music. So I would study very legitimate things all day long and then go and loiter around the Brill Building or 1650 Broadway. And I learned a wonderful um, word to say, yes. Uh, yes, I will do lead sheets for the Five Blind Boys of Alabama. Yes, I will arrange the Charlie Pride song folio. Yes, I will write the marching band version of Frosty the Snowman. Yes, I will do the high school concert band arrangement of Oye Como Va by Santana. Yes, I will take very little money for this. And I was working. I was 19 years old, and I was arranging for Gene Pitney. Now, Gene Pitney wasn't at the peak of his career at this point, but I'm still, I'm doing a session with Gene Pitney. I'm doing a, a session with the Drifters. I'm doing a session with the Platters. In one case, I was singing for the Platters. And my teachers would be on these sessions, and they'd say, gee, I really appreciate the work, and I hope you'll think of me again sometime. And then I'd go back to class, and they'd give me a C- minus on one of my tests, and I'd say, but you played this yesterday. Uh, I had the chance to get some real full-time work as an in the kind of producing A&R arranging uh, division of a small record label. There was a small problem. I couldn't do that and go to school at the same time. So I had to give up learning how to be in the music business because I found myself in the music business. <laughs> Indeed. Well, um, I'd love to hear more about the Brill Building. How did it actually work with all these people in cubicles writing away? It worked very well. It was um, sort of bringing to the arts all the elegance of the sweatshop, an assembly line process. Um, you'd walk into 1650 uh, Broadway that day, and uh, a publisher who had a couple of little cubby holes and some upright pianos would say, we got to get a song for such and such an artist. He's look I just heard that, I'm making up a name, Frankie Smith uh, needs a new song, and he wants it to be a ballad. And you'd go in a room and you'd write the ballad and you'd come out and play it for Bernie and Wolfie. Those were usually the guys who most of these companies had someone named Bernie or someone named Wolfie running. Them. And, uh, and he'd say, that's great. We've got to take it to him. His manager's on this eighth floor. Then we'd go up to the eighth floor, play it for the manager. He'd call Frankie and say, Frankie, come over here. They've got a song. I think it's pretty good for you. They'd go, oh, okay, fine. Then we'd go up to the twelfth floor where there was a re the record company that, he was, that the artist was on was there. And they'd say, well, we don't know about this. Make a demo for us. And then we'd go down into the basement where there'd be associated recording studio, four-track studio, and we'd do the demo. Then we'd take it back up to the eighth or the twelfth or the fourteenth floor. Sometimes you could write and make a record in one day, if it was raining out, you wouldn't get wet. You never left that one building. Everyone was very closely located, uh, and uh, tremendous amounts of, of work was being done in um, two different buildings. And as I say, one was 1650 Broadway, and the other was the Brill Building. The Brill Building, if there is a place that is Tin Pan Alley, uh, that was it. Uh, and it looks it. It's, it's that old Warner Brothers movie set office building with the person behind the office door. Their name has just been painted on the door, and in about three weeks it may get scratched off the door because they'll be out of the business. Tell me some of the people you worked with there. I'll tell you, the, the, one of the first thrilling assignments I had was to write some songs for, uh, and in one case with, uh, Paul Jones, the lead singer of Manfred Mann. He was making his own album uh, in New York, and suddenly I found myself with, uh, if I recall correctly, Artie Resnick, who wrote some of the, I think he wrote Under the Boardwalk, uh, and Paul Jones and myself, and we're banging away at a piano, coming up with some pretty interesting songs. I was in the last days of a dying uh, phase of the music business, where you had record labels that were run by one person. Uh, Scepter Records was run by a woman named Florence Greenberg. Her artist roster was Dionne Warwick and B.J. Thomas. All of Dionne Warwick's songs came out of 254 West 54th Street, the same building that became Studio 54 decades later. And the fate of the record label would depend on how Florence had done on vacation. If she had gambled a lot and lost, the roster would come, she'd come back from vacation and they'd lose uh, four singers and five secretaries. It was an a, a amazing world. I, I worked at, uh, my first record I ever did was for Roulette Records, which was run by a, a notorious fellow named Morris Levy. Morris Levy had a really scary voice, and he would say, uh, this is what we're going to do. For some reason, Frankie Lyman's songs were all co-written, supposedly, with Morris Levy. They all say on the copyright, Lyman 
Levy, and I never saw Morris ever play a piano. I just think he, uh, he said, yeah, we wrote that together. One time I saw someone negotiating a contract with him, and he finally said, uh, look, you want this in the contract? I'll put it in the contract. I'm not going to pay you. But if, you want, if it'll make you feel better if I put it in the contract, I'll put it in the contract. But you're not going to get any money. You understand that? These were amazing people. The first fellow I started writing for was named Paul Vance, whose uh, songs included Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini and Leader of the Laundromat, a much-needed parody of Leader of the Pack. Um, he once, uh, I heard him, overheard him one day saying to uh, someone on the phone, I got this kid working for me. He does all the voices. He sings all the voices on the records. He writes the songs with me. He writes all the arrangements. He does the lead sheets for free. When I, he plays most of the instruments on the record, and I'm paying him 30 bucks a song. And I thought to myself, he's paying me 30 bucks a song, and I don't know what I'm doing. It was the greatest education I could have ever gotten. <laughs> it sounds like it. Um, so what happened next? The little labels. Labels like Spring and Janus and Scepter, Wand. It was hard for them to compete uh, with the big labels that had all this heavyweight distribution. Um, as influence was peddled at radio stations as to what should be played, it became harder and harder for a little label to, to, to be able to hold their own with CBS coming in with both Epic Records and Columbia Records and all that roster of artists. And I found... Luckily, that CBS Records was interested in what I might do as a singer-songwriter and got signed there and really found myself on the boat of CBS Records as all the little ships were sinking uh, or being gobbled up. And pretty soon, you felt like there were five record labels in New York, and they were all in corporate office buildings, uh, had uh, taking up five, ten floors, and, uh, and executives there were told whether they could have a plant in their office or not. At what, you know, in other words, they were actually told what tier of success they were at. Say, so, well, you're not, and if you brought in your own plant and you weren't yet an executive high up enough to warrant a, having a plant, they'd say, no, you can't bring in that plant. You're not there yet. Uh, if you met an executive who had three plants, he probably ran the label. He was probably the, the head of A&R. Um, so I ended up on Epic Records and I made an album called Widescreen. And it was a very unusual album because it had, each song was its own little story. It had a lot of sound effects, dialogue, uh, different instrumentation for each cut. I felt that the story required different underscoring, so it wasn't like I had a band and we did the whole album. Each band on the, on the LP was, was a, a different session. Um, one of the cuts actually was a bit of an airplay hit in, in, in Great Britain, which was uh, called Our National Pastime about uh, a guy trying to pick up a girl at a Mets baseball game and trying to seduce her to the tune of the Star Spangled Banner. And I got a lot of critical acclaim for the album in the United States, but not m many were sold outside of New York and L.A. But I got a phone call, and the phone call was from a woman who said to me, Hi, this is Barbara Streisand. Uh, I've just listened to this album, and uh, um, I really like it, and I'd like to record some of the songs that you've written. I see that you do your own arrangements, so uh, maybe you should fly out here and... Uh, and do the charts for me as well. And I'm working on a film called A Star is Born. Uh, maybe you'd like to write some of the songs for that too. And I thought, who is this really? You know, that's the worst Barbara Streisand impression I've ever heard. And of course it was Barbara. And I went out there and suddenly I'm writing for, arranging for, and arranging and, pro uh, and producing um, one of the biggest vocal stars in the world. And that that is how the ch that was the biggest change in my life that ever took place because suddenly Barbara Streisand uh, was my evangelist and other people started recording my songs and I was lucky because all of this was under the auspices of CBS Records, a big label. And when I looked up from all of these incredible recording sessions, I saw that all the little labels that had populated New York City, um, they were all gone. They were just gone. Do you think that kind of rags to riches story is a very New York sort of story? Like, hey, we'll do the show right here. Well, I think it was if I wrote what happened to me, getting discovered by Barbara Streisand and suddenly having one of the world's most listened to singers singing my songs, if I wrote that as a screenplay, I'd get thrown out of the office. They'd say, come on, come in with something a little more credible. But it, it's what happened to me. It can happen in New York City because you're always brushing up against greatness. If you're working at any level in the studio, there's always a chance that you're going to suddenly um, be 
sitting in the same room with, with with someone who's legendary. It's the great thing about in LA because you don't walk you don't walk from one location to another. You don't rub up against as many people. You you're kind of sealed off. You're in your car, you get there, you go into the office, you get out of the meeting and then you drive another 15 miles and go somewhere else. But in New York, you I mean, how did I get my record deal at Epic Records? I was working with an engineer on the weekends making demos that that he and I both thought were interesting. Meanwhile, he was the engineer for Sly and the Family Stone. And Sly and the Family Stone's uh, producer is in the studio, and when they're having a couple of minutes to kill in between takes and things, he plays them a little tape that we've done, and he says, oh, come over to Epic. Well, I, I think we could make, you could make records there. It's just because you're always brushing up against people. And if you have some ability and persistence, you will probably get your shot. Whether you can deliver at that particular moment is another thing. Every once in a while, something lands in your lap, uh, but basically you create your own opportunities, and uh, when that moment comes, you have to be ready to kick in to high gear. I suddenly went from being a guy who was a struggling singer-songwriter and had been for several years to walking into a recording studio with a 60-piece orchestra uh, the arrangements on their music stands had been penned by me in Los Angeles. The vocalist on my right is Barbara Streisand, and I'm conducting. And I basically stood on that podium and said, I I've got to pull this together. I've got to do this, because I'm never going to have this opportunity again. I cannot, like, goof up here. I've got to act like I know what I'm doing, and I know how to conduct an orchestra, and I know how to arrange. And luckily I did. But there comes that moment where you where you say, here's where you find out if you can play in this league. Uh, when was this exactly? I got into the record business around 1968, although I don't think the record business knew that till about 1971. Um, but I was doing every kind of job in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, I made my first record album in 1974 as a, as a solo singer-songwriter. Prior to that, I was the voice of a lot of non-existent studio groups. Uh, I was the arranger of a lot of those kinds of records. I did commercial work as well. Uh, Barry Manilow and I used to compete for the same commercials. And later, I took one of the songs I had written as a commercial, changed the lyrics to it, made it into a pop song, and he ended up recording it. And I thought that there was some, some irony there that he didn't even realize that he was singing a song that he had been competing with as a, as a commercial when we were both trying to work in the jingle industry as well. The breakthrough for me came in '75. Uh, when Barbara Streisand started recording my songs. And then I started producing a lot of records in England, in part because the musicians were really interesting, and in part because I wanted to catch the West End season of plays, because I always had in my mind that I was going to work in theater. So I uh, produced, uh, with a terrific guy named Jeffrey Lesser, um, A Glass of Champagne by Sailor, and uh, Girls, Girls, Girls by Sailor, uh, an album or two with Straubs, some stuff with Sparks. Uh, they weren't British, but they were known more in Britain than they were in the United States. Uh, Hudson Ford, uh, and, and a great artist named John Miles, who I think it just had has so much talent, and uh, he, he was a wonderful guy to work with. And uh, so this took us into the late 70s, and I'm still at this time putting out my own albums, which people are listening to and record, covering my songs, but I've, at that, that point I hadn't had a top 10 hit. It wasn't until 79 that I had uh, the song with which I will forever be associated, which is uh, Escape the Pina Colada song. So that's the time frame we're talking about here. So how was that hit created? The story behind Escape the Pina Colada song is, is, is um, an odd one. I was recording my fifth album, and I had done too many ballads on it, and I needed something up-tempo to balance it out. I had a stupid song that I had one made up in my mind one day. I was walking down Fifth Avenue, and I noticed all the Italian designer stores. And I hummed to myself, uh, just as a, a, a joke, I hummed, uh, Fiorucci, baby, with your new Gucci shoes. Pucci, Pucci, baby, Gucci G's, Gucci goos. And this kind of vamp came into my head. Um, I turned the vamp into a song that felt like a kind of backwards reggae. And... So I had a track, and I went in, and I, I, the lyric was ostensibly going to be called People Need Other People, and I wrote enough of it to record the song. We did a session atop Radio City Music Hall on the seventh floor at a place called Plaza Sound, and, um, and I had this very elaborate arrangement of this song. Uh, it had many key changes, a bridge, some interesting harmonic progressions, and we recorded the first take, 
And we had two drummers on the session because the rhythm was a little complicated. And so af as you often did, after doing the first take, we'd go back in to listen to hear if things are being recorded the way we, we hope they are. And we listened to the first playback. And after it was done, I turned to the musicians and said, you know, I think, I think we've got a, a, we can do much better than this. And I looked and I saw that one of the drummers was unconscious on the floor from having too much fun. <laughs> and, um, and he was not going to get conscious. He had to be helped home. And we needed the two drummers, so we couldn't do any more recording of that song. It, I then did something that is now very commonplace, but at that time was almost unheard of. I found 16 bars of music in this whole four and a half minutes that we had been playing that was usable, that had a nice tight pocket to it, a nice good rhythm feel. And what is now done digitally very easily, I did laboriously. I duped, made, mean, I made copies from one two-inch master to another two-inch master of these same 16 bars over and over and over again. I then edited them together so that you had four minutes of just the, this 16 bar rhythm feel. I then said, okay, now I've got to write a song to overlay on this track. And I knew this, the story, it had better be a story song because there wasn't enough musically going on to be that interesting. So the story would have to be the interesting part. And I made up a million lyrics for it. I wrote one thing, everyone needs a victim, I believe you will find if you're cruel to another, if you're cruel to be kind. That didn't seem to work. Then I had, that's the law of the jungle in the school of the street. You get out of the kitchen if you can't take the heat. It sounded too much like a Billy Joel lyric. I didn't like that. I mean, like Billy Joel, didn't like copying him. And finally, the day before I was supposed to finish recording the L LP, I came up with this story idea, jotted it down at about 1 a.m., and it was going to go, if you like Humphrey Bogart and getting caught in the rain. And as I got on mic, I said to my, I said to my guitarist, I said, I, I've got a story song. It's got a little bit of a twist ending. So I'm going to do a take, a vocal take here, and I'm not going to stop even if I make a mistake. I'm just going to keep going because I want you to, I want to see if you get ahead of me, if you can guess the ending of the story. And you just listen. And I, don't be bothered if I, if I, if I, my voice cracks or something. I'm just going to plow through it. And just before I sang, I thought, you know, I don't want to say if you like Humphrey Bogart. I've done so many things about movies. Let's see, when someone's looking for an escape, a fantasy, it's like going on vacation, going to the islands. And when you go on vacation, you go to the islands, and someone asks you, a bartender says, what do you want to drink? You never order a beer. You, ne you don't order a Budweiser. Uh, you order, you want, you're on vacation. You want something in a hollowed out pineapple with the flags of all nations and parasols and stuff like that. And I thought, okay, what are the escape drinks? Um, Mai Tai, daiquiri, pina colada. I wonder what a pina colada tastes like. I'd never had one. But I threw that into the lyric. I said, if you like pina coladas and getting caught in the rain. Um, and when we were done with the song, I, I went into the, um, my guitar player and said, did you guess the ending? He said, no, it caught me by surprise. He said, I'm not crazy about the pina colada thing. I said, well, I thought it would work all right. And when I went to do the proper vocal, the good one, I couldn't get the same energy that I had singing at that one time on mic for, 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 uh, to see if I could surprise my band with the lyric. And the, the vocal that's on the record is the first and last time I ever sang that song on, for recording. Um, I didn't think that was the hit from the album. I thought that uh, a song that I had recorded for that album that was a hit was called Him, which did come out as a follow-up to Pina, the Pina Colada song and did chart it, I think, number six in Billboard. But the record label said, no, you, you, you've got to put out this record called Escape. This is the one. I said, I don't know, it's just, a, they put it out and immediately it began to vault up the charts. And I mean, really leaps and bounds, 10, 15, 20 points a week, still keeping its bullet every week. And, um, and they came to me and they said, Rupert, we've got a problem. You called the song Escape and people are calling into radio stations and going to record stores and they're asking for that song about the pina coladas. Can we call it Escape parenthesis, the pina colada song? And I said, what, to compromise my artistic integrity? That, how can you do that? They said, but if we don't do that, it's not going to sell a single copy. I said, hey, I guess it's the Pina Colada song. And even I have stopped calling it Escape, which is sad. I, I, I refer to it uh, as the Pina Colada song as well. It's, th there's a case of um, a couple of accidents in the studio. Leading, I would never have written that song if I had known it was going to be my best known hit. It's too simple. It's, I've never written anything that simple in my life. The, the music side of it is, is just those 16 bars. Even the bridge has, is an overlay on those same 16 bars. You, if you listen to the record carefully, you'll see that the guitarist, as he plays the riffs, is a model of consistency. And that's because it's the same 12 seconds over and over again.
But probably that's what helped, it, it, one of the things that helped make it a hit was that it was um, simple and catchy, that's a nice way of putting it, and, uh, and it left room for the story. And a great story it is, both in the song and about the song. So in the 70s, what kind of places did you go in New York? Were you a club guy? I was a bit different maybe from a lot of the people my age in the 70s in that I wanted to find the New York that I had just missed. That was the New York of the 1940s. I, I loved jazz, and, uh, and I, I wished that I could have been around for when New York was teeming with jazz clubs everywhere. But there were still enough jazz clubs in that time in the 70s that you could go. Um, 52nd Street was really good for jazz clubs. Um, they had Eddie Condon's there, and... Um, yeah, and Jimmy Ryan's, I think. I'm, I, may be, I think I'm getting these names right. Both of those were traditionally Dixieland clubs, but they'd get in some bop musicians occasionally. Uh, or you'd go downtown, Blue Note, um, you'd see people like Sonny Stitt, a great uh, sax player. Bucky Pizzarelli, the jazz guitarist, uh, who still plays quite a bit and plays with his son, who has dominion over New York right now, John Pizzarelli. The nice thing about the Midtown jazz clubs was that any hour you walked in there, there was some jazz being played. And it didn't have to be necessarily a name brand star. Everyone is good. In New York City, every jazz musician is terrific. If, if you're not terrific, you're, you're going to starve. So it wouldn't, if you went and saw a, what, what you'd call a house band or a pickup band, some band that was just where the guys hardly knew each other and they were going to play for this week, and you, you could always tell because on the break they'd always kind of like shake hands as if they'd met for the first time, um, you'd always hear great jazz, really great jazz. So I, I heard a lot of that. The club scene was pretty good. Reno Sweeney's was, was the place where you heard really good cabaret artists. And uh, I uh, used to hear people like Andrea Marcovici there. Um, I got lots of invitations because I was producing Barbara Streisand at that time. Every female vocalist in, in America would invite me to come hear her because they thought, well, if he's good enough for Barbara, I guess he's, he would be good enough to produce me. So uh, I, I heard a profusion of uh, Laney's and Lana's and, uh, and Janie's and just a lot of different singers in that time. And it, it was all pretty good. Um, the disco scene, I went to this very if I went at all, because it was so loud. I like to converse with people when I went out, and you just couldn't talk. You just have to abandon your, your voice at the door. Um, so I went to some of the more legit. I remember one that was called The Library, and uh, there was another one on 86th Street that was like a, supposed to be like a European village, slightly underground. And that was a good location for it, because that was an old German, Czechoslovakian, Hungarian neighborhood. But um, I, didn't, I didn't do too much of like Cheetah or any of those places or um, Electric Butterfly or something. I can't remember. It was a place that had butterflies as, as their flooring. So I can't speak with much experience from the disco scene. But the jazz clubs were great even then. And the cover charges were pretty reasonable. So you could sit there and, and, and nurse a, a, a scotch and soda for two hours and hear some amazing solos. And when those solos were over, you knew you would never hear them again because it was live and happening in that moment. And the improvisation was the sum total of not just what they were feeling, but the smell of French fries uh, in, from wafting out of the kitchen and the way a woman in the corner was laughing. And it was all in that moment. I, I missed that scene. Now when you go to a jazz club, it's so expensive and so formal. And it's such a big deal because they've got this artist in for one week and it's $120 to sit down and you must have dinner. And all the fun of it. All that spontaneity, the, the, the grease frying and the woman in the corner laughing, uh, that's not around anymore. Now, all those jazz musicians you're talking about, a lot of them were playing on pop records uh, in the studios, uh, probably for you. Well, musicians had this need to make a living. The conflict for musicians in New York, at least in the er eras that I knew of, the 70s and the 80s, before I started working more in theater, um, the conflict was that the best money was to be made with the least interesting work. And it got depressing. In other words, the Brecker brothers, fantastic musicians, uh, Grady Tate. Uh, th these are drummers who, for pleasure, would play on a Paul Simon album. But they also wanted to earn a living. And if they went into a studio and played a thing that would say at the top of the music, um, Coca-Cola, 32nd. That could make them more money than they ever would make doing the Paul Simon album. It used to get depressing because 
musicians would come in to do a session and when they saw that it wasn't a commercial, that it wasn't a jingle, that it was just going to be a record, a recording on someone's album, they looked depressed because there goes the residuals that they would earn for the, the commercial. The best people would come in and could be any kind of musician you needed them to be that, that day. I worked with a French horn player named Peter Gordon. He, I mean, think of this. He doubled as being the lead French hornist of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, and he also played with Tito Puente. Now, that's absurd. And in other eras and other cities, a French horn player would say, well, I can't. I'll blow my lip with Tito Puente. I, I've got to stay. To the... you, you could put any kind of piece of music in front of any kind of top-notch studio musician. He could not only sight-read it perfectly, but he could play in the correct style. Marv Stam was a trumpet player who I admired so much for his solo work with the, uh, Stan Kenton's band in the 60s. In high school, I used to listen to him, and I, suddenly I'm working with Marv Stam. And you put in front of him uh, a classical um, trumpet part, such as you would see in Bach, and he would play that, and, or he'd switch to a tr pocket trumpet. And then you'd ask him for a flugelhorn in the style of uh, Maiden Ferguson, and he'd do that. And then he'd switch over, and you'd need something in a kind of mock Dixieland feel with a muted trumpet, and he'd do that. And they could all do everything. Uh, and because of that, they all had to learn every... It, to work in New York, you had to be able to walk in on a moment's notice and play any kind of style of music, whether it would be schmaltzy, whether it would be Burt Bacharach, whether it would be heavy metal, you had to be prepared to do that. And the only way you learned that was to listen to everything and to talk with all the other musicians and figure out how they were doing what they were doing. The first drummer to have six tom-toms was a guy named Jimmy Young. And you, you hired Jimmy Young just for those six tom-toms because if you had something that you wanted to sound like Hawaii Five-0 or something where you needed the drums to go like boom, 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 you had to get Jimmy Young. So other drummers would say, well, I'm not going to let Jimmy Young steal it. So they got six tom-toms. They said, now, how does he do that thing? And they'd pick it up. There was a bar, and I blanked on the name. It's two guys' names, Light Nate and Al's, but I don't think it was Nate and Al's. There was a bar where every musician would hang out. And you could book a recording session by calling the bartender. You'd call the bar, and you'd say, look, I have a session tomorrow. I'm going to need two French horns. Uh, or I'm going to need uh, a tenor sax. Who's there? And they'd say, uh, yeah, you, you're free tomorrow, and the bartender would book the whole session for you. It finally got bought, I think, by the Brecker brothers, and they called the bar uh, Possible 20, because when you booked a, a jingle session, a commercial session, you always booked people for an hour with a Possible 20. That was, the Possible 20 was, was if you were running a little over. And, and you got paid a little better money for the Possible 20 than you had for the hour. But uh, uh, that, this was the, that was the bar where you could basically... Uh, in New York City, book any kind of recording session you wanted just by, by talking to the, the waitress. As a songwriter, who were the New York songwriters who you admired the most? Paul Simon was just turning out one gem after another. Every song respected your intelligence, came from a different neighborhood, and you would never be able to predict what his next single would sound like, what the rhythm feel or instrumentation of it would be. Uh, Billy Joel came in with such energy and drive, and you had to love him. And he wasn't going to let you not love him, and I admired him tremendously for that. Um, I think in the 70s, to be honest with you, New York artists, um, those two, I think, were maybe the firebrands. And then on the pop side of it, Barry Manilow is going to start getting a lot more credit as the years go by for the kind of melodic and memorable records he made. It's uh, a little easy to dismiss that stuff. Barry Manilow is a, a guilty pleasure, and all that has to happen now is we, people have to stop feeling guilty about it. Those are wonderful records. Um, they, they soar. Um, and some of the th trying to get the feeling again is one of the great records I think uh, ever made. I love that record. So he was maybe number three, and uh, Melissa Manchester out of New York, who I have had the pleasure of both knowing and working with. Um, on the on the New York side of it, she and uh, I, I I don't always think of Carly Simon as a New Yorker. She always seemed to be on Martha, up in Martha's Vineyard, so she probably was a, a, a quintessential New Yorker. But I think very much Melissa whose father played bassoon with the Met Opera, and she uh, grew up in the Bronx and, and, and just was really comfortable on the streets of New York. Why do you think it is that so many New York places are celebrated in the songs of New York songwriters? Well, you know, 
New York is a kaleidoscope. As you walk around it, you, you, yes, you're in a city, and yes, there's a lot of concrete to be seen and a lot of car exhaust, but each, each neighborhood has its own pungency, its own flavor. And, uh, and you can be walking around Doyer Street in Chinatown where, where the dim sum on your table is totaled by the plates that you've eaten off of. That's their abacus for adding up the... And then walk a couple blocks and you're suddenly in a, 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 on, on Little Market Street and you're, there's a mom-and-pop restaurant there that's been there maybe 120 years and there's a set of chimes in the window and you don't even know why. Uh, and then you go a little farther and you're in an uh, Indian restaurant neighborhood where there's a place called Curry in a Hurry. And as you move about New York and the boroughs, the, the flavor is of, of where you are, whether you're in some kind of Tudor, mock Tudor neighborhood aspiring to elegance or somewhere really seedy but fun to be. Um, it, it, it's just part of the pungency of the city and the diversity of the city. And I think as a songwriter, um, you need color and flavor in, in your work. And I, I think that, uh, uh, I know in my own writing, I love to write about food because it's something that people can connect to very easily. Everyone's hungry at some time during the course of the day. And I think Paul probably lo loved these neighborhoods that he knew. So whether it's, when, when he sings about me and Julio down in the schoolyard, you can see that schoolyard in your mind uh, just as clearly as, as the, whatever he was uh, feeling when he was so groovy on the 59th Street Bridge. Before the era of music videos, songs didn't come with an image attached to them. They were like the golden age of American radio where the listener made up the pictures. And songs that told stories or were about places or the people and how the place affected them, they needed to do their own cinematography. The lyric had to give you the images. And so I think when Paul writes about neighborhoods, he was being sort of, he was making the music video, embedding it in, in the lyric itself. Nowadays, a song needn't work as hard to give you an image. Very often, the very memorable images you get in a music video don't have all that much to do with the lyric of the song as it is. Uh, when I hear a, sl a sledgehammer, great record, could, would have been a hit without the video. When I think of the video, I think of something very specific and, and, and I can't think of anything else. I don't have the chance to create my own image because that image is, the animation in sledgehammer is so strong that, that it overrides my ability to make up my own story in my head. Uh, but in the 70s, in, leading in, up to the 80s, um, you still had the chance in a lyric to help the listener paint the picture. And using specific neighborhoods, references to the way things taste, the way things feel, uh, just little details. I wrote a song with Barbara Streisand um, that had a lyric, uh, recently uh, he moved out on me, took the towels we stole from some motel in Tennessee. And people would always come up to me and say, sing me the song about the towels. What they remembered in the song was this image of, of a couple and, and the towels that they always remembered that they stole from a, a motel in Tennessee. That was the music video within the lyric at that time. Now, of course, writing songs for the theater is kind of like creating the visuals live action. Tell me about uh, how you moved from being a pop star to being a Broadway guy. I'd always wanted to write for theater. When I was a teenager, I, I really couldn't make up my mind if I wanted to be a composer or if I wanted to be a writer. And I knew I wanted to work initially in a populist medium. So I figured if I wrote story songs, I could have my cake and eat it too, that I could, I could do the t storytelling that I wanted to do within the form of a pop song. But I'd always hoped to get into theater, to write straight plays, thrillers, and uh, musicals. And as a matter of fact, the reason I produced a lot of the rock bands in the 70s that I did in London was so that I could catch the West End season and see my season of Simon Gray and Alan Akeborn and Tom Stoppard. And, and the greatest memories I have in theater are from the London shows that I saw in the 70s, including the farces with Leslie Phillips and um, even caught some with Brian Ricks, stuff like that. So uh, names that mean nothing uh, in the United States but mean everything to me. And I was working at uh, a club in New York Rodney Dangerfield's club, a comedy club, at the, and when in the days when Rodney still performed there, and I was doing a, a sort of comedy and music nightclub act, and the legendary producer Joseph Papp, who produced a chorus line, 
came to me after a show. He caught a show, and he said, you know, you're doing, like, little plays up there. You're doing, like, mini musicals within your songs. He said, have you ever thought about writing a, a full-scale musical? And I thought to myself, how many playwrights or composers in New York would kill to get the attention of Joe Papp, the produ legendary producer, for, for five minutes? And here he is saying, I'd be interested in what you would have to write. And I said to him, well, actually, I have had an idea that I've been thinking about for almost 10 years now, just never gotten around to doing it. It's such an undertaking. And he said, well, tell me about it. I said, well, um, let me write it first, because it'll be hard to tell you about it. It'll be easy to perform it for you. And I then took the biggest risk I ever took in my career, which is uh, I took three years out of my life and wrote a Broadway musical with uh, the assumption that Joe Papp would listen to it when I was all done. Uh, I could afford to do that because the Pina Colada song had, had given me enough income from the writer's royalties um, to do that, but it was very risky. Um, I worked a little on a movie called No Small Affair during that time, but other than that, I was writing the musical. And I based it on an unfinished novel by Charles Dickens that I had always been haunted by called The Mystery of Edwin Drood. He had died exactly halfway through the play. He had planned to write it in 12 installments, and he died... The, the day after he finished writing installment six. And I thought it would be the height of theatricality if instead of Rupert Holmes trying to write a mock Dickensian ending for the story, if I wrote hundreds of variables and allowed the audience to vote at each performance on how they thought the story should end. So that any given night you could see any one of nine murderers confess for d nine different reasons, find any one of 36 lovers to be the lovers who are united at the end, and uh, 12 possibilities of detectives in disguise. Uh, with all those permutations, there are over 480 endings to the show. And I was going, when I got done, I was going to demand from Joe Papp that he give me a workshop production of this thing after I had spent three years of my life. And I went in and I stood in his office and I performed the entire musical form, standing there playing every role, singing every song. And when I was done, he looked at me and said, well, okay, look, here's what we'll do. He said, uh, you know, we do free Shakespeare in Central Park every year. So this year you'll be Shakespeare and uh, we'll do it in Central Park with, you know, like maybe a 15-piece band and some stars. And then um, if it goes well there, then we'll take it to Broadway. And I said, no, I demand a workshop. <laughs> I, uh, I, and I stood there stunned. And the next thing I knew, my musical was being performed with a cast that included Cleo Lane, Betty Buckley, George Rose, uh, unbelievable New York Broadway performers. The show was very well received in Central Park. As a matter of fact, people were standing online at 5 a.m. Uh, to, to see a show that wouldn't begin till 8.30 in the evening. And we went to the Imperial Theater on Broadway, and we opened, and the show was a success, and we won all the Tony Awards you could ever hope for. We won Best Musical, I won Best Book, uh, and Best Score. Uh, George Rose won Best Actor, uh, and the director won Best Director. And um, I was suddenly writing for theater, um, which I'd always wanted to do. And the cast members would, um, they would uh, introduce me and say, this is Rupert Holmes, he wrote the songs in our show. And I would say, you know, I also wrote that, that other stuff you do called dialogue, you know, I, I, that, that's my dialogue you're doing. And so I realized that uh, it would become necessary for me to write um, a straight play uh, without music, to assert that I actually like to write plays as well. I wrote a thriller that was on Broadway called Accomplice, starred Jason Alexander and Michael McKeon, who was from Spinal Tap and uh, won an Edgar Award from the Mystery of Writers of America for that, did a tour de force on Broadway for Stacey Keach called Solitary Confinement, and uh, just this year wrote um, a show that was nominated for a Tony for Best Play, my first time I've been nominated for a play, uh, as opposed to a musical, uh, about the life of George Burns called Say Goodnight Gracie. And uh, I, I was able somehow to make this transition. People used to say, is it odd that you're a pop songwriter and now you're writing for Broadway. And I say, well, you know, pop music used to come from Broadway. It's only been odd that a pop writer would write for Broadway um, in recent decades. But most of the catalog of American pop music comes from things that were shows on Broadway, especially Rodgers and Hart, Rodgers and Hammerstein, Jerome Kern. All of those writers were pop songwriters um, writing for the stage. 
Um, a little unusual that I write the book as well. Uh, but as I say, from when I was a teenager, I, I always had it in my mind that I would write the book uh, to write plays that were uh, not musicals as well. So um, it's it's been a, a, an amazing transition in my life. And now I have a novel out, so uh, published by Random House, and it's been wonderfully received. So uh, I've, I, I think I'm I'm just I've done about all the different genres that I care about. I have no urge to direct. Um, I've written movie screenplays, but uh, I don't enjoy that as much. I like the limitations of the stage. I love that uh, that when the curtain goes up on a one set thriller, uh, that it's all going to have to be resolved in that house, that library, that study, and that you can't all suddenly go to Spain. Uh, it's, I, I, you know, carte blanche to me is the most frightening thing in the world. I love the limitations of having it in a set. One last question, since the program is about Manhattan. If you had to pick a song that, to you, expresses everything about New York, what would it be? This is probably the obvious choice, but it happens to be the one that I think is most representative. I, I, I love the uh, Rogers and Hart song, Manhattan, uh, because it itemizes all so many locations in it. Uh, and tell me Watt Street compares to Mott Street in July. We'll go to Coney and eat bologna on a roll. I mean, just when the, it was one of the first songs that Rodgers and Hart ever wrote for a musical called The Garrick Gaieties. And, uh, and they had it all in the first two lines. We'll take Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island, too. It's lovely going to the zoo. The diversity of Manhattan and of, of New York City, the, the sense of... Uh, wonder that you have when you're first wandering around it and every corner reveals some amazing thing, some ridiculous place or a fascinating store. Um, I think that the song Manhattan captured that very well. Radio Richard.